a pleasure to. So we are waiting a few minutes uh, for more people to join us today, but that we are we are already here, and we want to uh, hear what do you want to see during this webinar series. What are your expectations? So please first join us in Slido. You can use the QR code that is in the screen right now, or also you can um, join at slido.com with this number. So please tell us what are your expectations for this webinar series? What do you wanna learn? Uh, what do you wanna know? There's something specific or you're here for our amazing speakers. Let us know what do you think. The speakers. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think a lot of people is joining for them. I hope you enjoy a lot their presentations. To learn about James based carbon assessment. Yes, that's a really great topic. I hope you can learn a lot from our amazing speaker today. To learn more about carbon and forest, uh, about this topic, which is not the closest to me. Yeah, but it's a really important topic. That's why we also are organizing uh, this webinar series. So. Uh, we hope we can meet your expectations. About the role of forest and how carbon affects its health. Yes, it's very important. To learn about the role of carbon in forest. Yes. So I hope you can also join us for the rest of the episodes. But for today, I think we, we are going to meet your expectations. Expand my knowledge about forests with great speakers. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, you can still send their um their expectations here on the Slido. Okay, so maybe there is no more people already told everything, so we are here uh for the same reason. So we hope you can learn a lot today and the rest of the episode. So before we start this, uh, we want to remind you the house rules. So please kindly mute yourselves for the entirety of the event. Uh, also, we are having a Q&A portion at the end of both presentations. So if you have any questions, please uh, uh, write it through the chat box or you can use also the hand function. Um, or uh, you can uh, ask your question personally. So uh, any of the moderators can give you the word for this. Also, if you have any internet connectivity issues, uh, kindly take note of the Zoom credentials so you can um, rejoin our conference. And as you may notice now, uh, our session is being recorded for documentation purposes. So we encourage you to um, use an appropriate behavior for the entire event. And uh, lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties, you can reach out to any of the hosts here so we can help you. So let's start now. Uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us. My name is Jasmine Lopez and together with Karina Rosales, we are going to be your moderators for today's session. So we are here to help you and guide you through this event. So this webinar series is organized by IFSA. And if you don't know what is IFSA, it's the largest international association for students of forestry and related fields. It was established in, in the 90s, so it has been a while. And we are really excited for you today being here. Next one. As the, uh, the vision and mission of IFSA is to uh, get a word that appreciates forests. That's why we are organizing this kind of events. And also our mission is to enrich our members through education, through international events, networking, and intercultural exchange. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, so in that context, for some years, ITSA has been celebrating the International Day of Force with different kind of events. And for this year, the chosen topic was healthy forests for healthy people. 
And in IMSA, we decided to host, as you already know, this webinar series. And today we're having our first episode. So for that, we are hosting um, two amazing speakers. And the first one is, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Shalini Diani. Uh, she will be presenting about the role of forest in, uh, in carbon sequestration. Uh, we're very honored to have her here. She's um, a senior scientist in the SEER National Environment and Engineering Research Institute in India. She's uh, Asia's vice chair and steering committee member of the Commission on Ecosystem Management of the IUCN and works on interlinkages between socio-ecological system, including indigenous uh, management, um, indigenous uh, knowledge, um, and local non lo sorry, knowledge system for ecosystem health assessment. She also works in restoration of degraded landscapes, disaster risk reduction, and also climate change adaptation using nature-based solution and sustainability science approaches. So she's amazing. <laughs> um, she also is experienced in sectoral integration for developing Brazilian landscapes and improving corporate community partnership for climate sensitive landscape restoration through multidisciplinary efforts. She also brings experience in science policy integration as lead author of the recently released IPES global thematic assessment on the sustainable use of wild species in the Asia Pacific regional assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services. She has many high impact peer reviewed national and international research papers, edited books and popular articles to her credit. So a very warm welcome to her. We're very honored to have you here. Thank you very much. And we also have another amazing speaker. He's the professor, Jan Joseph Dida. He will be talking about the overview of GIS-based carbon assessment. Um, he's an assistant professor of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Um, he's a registered forester and environmental planner and she, he's an associate member of the National Research Council of the Philippines. So uh, for that not being uh, like a tiny thing, he also obtained his undergraduate degree in forestry and graduate degree in natural resource, resources conservation from the same university that was mentioned before, the University of Los Baños in the Philippines. He also took a continuing education subject in geographic information system in Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, the United States. And his research interests and studies include the application of GIS and remote sensing in natural resources management and environmental planning. He was previously, uh, he previously served as vice president in IFSA and also a counselor. So he's been linked with IFSA before, and thank you very much for keeping this um, link. And also, uh, he uh, was secretary of the UN Philippine Youth Advisory Board. So thank you very much. Welcome. And I wish you the best talk ever. <laughs> so to go back to our first speaker, um, Dr. Shalini, please. Uh, you can take the floor, share your screen, and we'll be thrilled to hear your talk. Uh, thank you, Karina. I think this is a great opportunity to be a uh, part of this uh, webinar series. And I'm also happy to share that this is my first webinar, second webinar with IFSA. I had the first one in 2020, uh, where I was invited for uh, World Environment Day, I think. So that's really a nice opportunity to be back again. And the second thing is I'm also, because representing IUC and CEM, we are having the first ever Asia steering committee member in India. So that's a, another important thing that, and we'll be discussing definitely a lot on 
uh, red, uh, the ecosystem health of forest in Asia, because that definitely needs health assessment in terms of understanding where the threats are lying. So without much uh, delay, I'll directly share my slides because I think I have been allocated about 20 minutes uh, and would like to just focus on how best I can share my work. So I'm sure I'm audible to everyone and visible. My slides are visible too. Can you just say yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, my uh, talk will be about the role of forest in carbon sequestration. As, and as you know that I work on socio-ecological interactions also. So my experiences will also come from there and why it is so important to look to these multi, uh, multiple values and benefits and services that forests provide us. Uh, so this has been a very interesting slide that I would always like to put up. The reason is whatever is there, it shows that uh, the ecosystems have a very special role. You talk about sustainable development goals or you talk about biodiversity or land degradation neutrality or understanding the ecosystem risk uh, there. And then of course, bond challenge related with uh, forest landscape restoration, restoration decade that is running right now. Uh, it's a very, very cross-cutting area. Healthy ecosystems are something that can actually address a lot of these issues and also help the entire world to reach the global sustainability agenda. Now, last few years have been really uh, uh, where the entire world, entire international community into climate change or biodiversity conservation has been repeatedly talking about loss of biodiversity and also about impact of land degradation on climate change and disaster risks that are increasing every passing years. And because I come from Asia, I also know that there is a huge risk uh, for Asia. It's very sensitive. And we are also one of the hotspots of land degradation. China and India are on the top of the land degradation maps. Now, over the years, Communities have recognized it, governments are acknowledging it, and international community is also concerned that forests are actually very important when you talk about developing resilient, resilient ecosystems and resilient and sustainable societies, and that's very much required for achieving human well-being. So communities have been doing this for generations to have sustainable use of wild species and also conserving their forest areas by rotational harvesting and rot rotational use of these species. But uh, over the year, the development has taken place in a very massive scale and rapid pace. It has definitely exerted a lot of pressure on our pristine and undisturbed forest areas. And that's why now we know that most of our forest areas, are, especially in Asia, are very open and they're not as dense as they used to be. And maybe my next uh, speaker, being a GIS expert, will throw some light on that aspect as well. And there was this very interesting uh, aspect of the last COP on climate, COP27, that, that was the first very time when they started talking about biodiversity, and that is very much documented also this time, that climate change and biodiversity are loss are not two different things. We have to come breaking these silos to work together and addressing both the things together. So encouraging, and, and noting that protection of biodiversity and natural ecosystems is very important, especially the ecosystems that have been intact and protected for a very longer time and that are getting exposed to a lot of development, uh, the drivers of climate change, and of course, socioeconomic and other drivers that I'll be discussing later. And then we also need to understand that there has to be urgent need to understand in a very synergistic and comprehensive manner how these both can be addressed. And then, of course, encouraging parties, because now uh, they have already listed and documented nature-based climate solution as one of the aspects how we can ensure that these uh, carbon sinks are very much protected and they can enhance carbon sequestration by planting additional species in a very judicious and scientifically planned, as well as uh, using indigenous knowledge systems. And similarly, if you see, uh, this was another turning point last year when Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Protocol, the Global Biodiversity Framework, GBF, was approved. And it also talked about, and now if you see our targets are also increased, 
So reducing the threats, meeting people's need, tools and solutions for implementing monitoring. So these were some of the key areas and that's where the importance of carbon and also going beyond carbon plays a very important role. So when I talk uh, in general for the participants, when we talk about carbon pool, we know that according to IPCC, there are five important carbon pools in natural forest areas. We have above ground biomass, the, the biomass that grows very fast, and then below ground biomass and also soil carbon, littered deadwood, both logs and snags, the necromass on the forest floor is very much contributing to this in our entire carbon pool. And Ecosystem carbon needs to be protected considering the carbon budget and we are almost closer to the threshold levels and we have a very, very less time of next seven or eight years to actually implement just by 2030 we have to implement and achieve the results of nature based solutions to ensure that terrestrial carbon stock and terrestrial uh, carbon sequestration happens in a faster pace. Now, if we talk in general about the natural forest, we know that they have a high potential for fixing carbon. And most of the natural forests have high biomass carbon stock. So be it temperate areas, subtropical or tropical areas, on altitudinal gradient, we find they have good potential to actually fix this carbon. Whereas it was also observed in this publication that plantation forests have exhibited highest soil organic carbon stock. So these are two important aspects. And we also need to understand that rich forests also have huge soil carbon stock uh, because of this entire microbial activity and the fixation that happens in the deeper depths of soil. And this was also a similar kind of uh, work that we observed in India because I have a lot of my work that comes from central India and mountains. We found that uh, mostly the trees that have uh, forests that have highly biodiverse conditions that are mixed broadleaf forest areas are also, for example, these banjo forests that are very much providing a lot of subsistence to local communities. The oak forests have high uh, carbon stock in comparison to pinus that's a very mono monoculture in these areas. So this also reflects to that why we need to have more diversity and diverse uh, uh, tree a restoration approach when we plan these uh, plantations and restoration because they not only bring in diversity, they also are a lot of stress tolerant and also they provide a lot of resilience and develop resilient ecosystems. Uh, we also did a lot of studies in central part of India that is now undergoing a lot of massive development because of mining and thermal power projects. And we found that still because India gets a lot of its carbon uh, contribution, the carbon sequestration is contributed a lot by subtropical forest areas of Shoria Robusta and Tectona Grandis or Teak. And these are the areas that are in the central India. Again, not only rich forest areas, but also very high uh, uh, native local people uh, diversity is also present in these areas. So over the years, what we have observed that these areas are also very rich in carbon stock, but over the years, this is depleting because of land degradation, because of many reasons, mining, development, urbanization. So that is resulting in loss of biodiversity, loss of carbon stock, and release of carbon back into the atmosphere. So not only uh, natural forest areas, urban forest cover is also very important contribution, providing a very important contribution to tree carbon stock. And government of India is actually looking beyond forest and seeing how these urban forest areas and tree forest areas can contribute to the NDC challenges NDC uh, targets for the country. Giving you a little perspective on how nationally determined contribution commitments are for South Asian countries, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, they all are uh, committing in terms of carbon coming from their forest areas and also trying to see how we can further include tree outside forest areas. So for example, uh, Bangladesh uh, considers unconditional contribution to reduce GHG by 5% and also emission reduction from agriculture and development of forest sector. So forest sector is one of a key component if you see for targeting and achieving NDCs in Bangladesh, in India, and India has been a very pioneer in terms of, of seeing how every year it, uh, uh, it very much observes and monitors their carbon stock and also sees how their forests are growing. And then if you have read a recent publication on how people's participation has helped 
Nepal to achieve uh, this target and greening their greening back their deforested area. So that's a good uh, contribution and example. Pakistan, of course, they are also trying this uh, the plantation tsunami to ensure that the degraded forest areas are conserved back. And again, Sri Lanka is also in the same pace. Uh, if you see the condition in terms of scenario, in terms of Red Plus policies, all these countries, uh, countries in South Asia are actually contributing to the objective of improving forest and tree cover. They have their national forest policy. Nepal is also having the Red Plus strategy to ensure that we have, uh, Nepal has a, uh, approach to national forestry with a vision for forest for people's for prosperity. And this is very much reflected in the recent studies and reflections how they have enhanced and linked it by uh, uh, people's uh, priority for their livelihood that has helped to prosper forest as well. Then Pakistan has a lot of policies in place and Sri Lanka is also taking policy measures to ensure that forested areas are conserved and at the same time they are also seeing how they can be further restored to meet the NDCs. Now, over the year, what we have uh, of observed that forest dynamics in the warming world is changing quite rapidly. There are species that are vulnerable to climate change. There are also species that are vulnerable because and forest areas are vulnerable to a lot of development happening in this region. Uh, Agroforestry can definitely be one of the areas when we talk about uh, tree outside forest because this has a huge uh, adaptation and mitigation potential but we again need to see if we are not able to conserve our forest areas, what we'll do by conserving the tree outside forest areas. So there should be an approach where tree outside forest areas as well as forested areas are conserved for meeting the NDC and carbon sequestration targets. Over the years, we also observed that the forest types in India are changing. Uh, the champion and state gave the first forest types of India. So about 16 different forest types and then more than almost 120 different subtypes. Over the years, when they were analyzed through GIS studies, we found that a lot of our forest areas are actually getting modified and are getting predominantly uh, uh, occupied by degraded formations or plantations or horticulture, mixed forest formation. And many of these forest areas that were earlier biodiversity hotspots, like in Eastern Himalayas, Western Ghats, they are actually slowly getting degraded because of a lot of anthropogenic activities. When I talk about carbon uh, forest type uh, and the, the kind of uh, the annual net gain that is in terms of growth of forest area, India ranks number third in the world. Every two years, uh, the Forest Survey of India prepares a report. And according to that, in 2019, 24.56% has increased. And in last report, 2021 report also, there has been a substantial increase in forest cover. To meet the, the climate commitments, it is said that India should have at least 33% of geographical area under forest cover by 2022. But again, this means that a lot of tree outside forest cover will be included in this assessment. So over the years, what has happened that uh, <coughs> dense and moderately dense forests have reduced and open forests have increased tremendously. Uh, they are very much linked with our climate and uh, climate promises. And at the same time, there is a huge uh, uh, sequestration that is uh, coming uh, from these forest areas. So if you see India, there is about, uh, as per 2017 estimation, we have about 7,083 million tons that is thought to be uh, and reported to be, uh, that is uh, carbon stock that is conserved in our forest areas. And uh, the annual increase is about 19.50 million tons. And this is going to increase every year. But again, this uh, contribution is coming a lot from tree forest area areas, whereas forested areas are getting depleted. So where are the major reasons behind this decline? So one of the reasons can be climate change, uh, because our studies have seen that over the years, uh, though the changes and transitions are very slow, but uh, the forest formations are changing. So it's no more climatic climax. Forests are now having more serial kind of combinations. So if these uh, climatic climax forests are disturbed, many of these species are going to affect the presence of other species as well. And for example, for in the case of oak, when we analyze 30 years of occurrence data, we find that there will be a significant decline in this particular area where a substantial amount of uh, subsistence requirement of local people are being fulfilled by uh, these oak forest areas. And of course, another interesting point is upward movement. 
uh, but again uh, it might look good for some of the people that a uh, species is getting upward movement and will be able to save its uh, presence but in other cases the more threatened species in higher altitudes will be more on the verge of extinction if this upward movement happens similar is the case with other species that are in riparian forest fringes and have been contributing some good significant amount of protection to riparian buffers also that are also vulnerable because of this climate variability. So there is a clear indication that we are actually using our forest ecosystem for diversified purposes. Agriculture can be one, uh, development can be other, infrastructure buildup, urbanization, mining. So this is actually leading to a ecosystem, uh, leading to a land use intensity that is a greater change. And then there is also a shift from smaller to greater trade-off between ecosystem services and biodiversity that is leading to a stage where even our hotspots are getting converted into abandoned land use. Now, this is a very alarming situation. And there is also uh, a thought behind that there are chances that many of these uh, rich forest ecosystems are facing hidden collapse. Again, another driver, as I mentioned, is uh, people-centric, where socioeconomic dynamics is shaping many ecosystems across the country and when this ecosystem dynamics suffers there are significant chances that it would also affect the carbon stocks and release of this carbon back into the environment leading to uh, impacting the existing carbon budget in a worse manner so if i come to the last uh, few slides what uh, we have uh, worked in recently in this uh, uh, study that was published in uh, nature biodiversity we found that if we actually want to conserve and meet these climate or biodiversity priorities, it's very important that we think about uh, people-centric opportunities, local consultations and need assessment, because most of these communities have been living in close harmony with the forest and natural ecosystem. They know what type of species were there. They also need understand the uncertainty of climate. They also need understand what kind of species and how they shift and what kind of land degradation has happened over the decade. So there is an opportunity actually uh, to have more people-centric approaches and opportunities, but thinking beyond carbon and forest-based restoration project, because carbon can be one of the core benefits emerging for, from restoration, but it should be very much based on people-centric requirements and opportunities. And this is also where policymakers can actually translate global nature-based solution or nature-based climate solution prioritization for application, but it should be very much rooted in societal challenges. So we developed this another approach, how uh, private sector financing can be linked to this entire uh, restoration planning, where uh, in the planning phase itself, there should be acceptance of uncertainty. Uncertainty is climate change and ensuring how hybrid knowledge-based system can be involved together for mapping of degraded lands, uh, understanding which species will be uh, able to survive the changing climate. So of course, uh, modeling approaches and all the scientific uh, advanced tools and approaches can be introduced. But for the implementation phase, we definitely need people because government cannot be everywhere to do everything. And ensuring that citizen scientists, uh, then your drone-based and UAV monitoring can help to develop big data because this big data can contribute the countries to meet NDCs. It can also help us to meet different challenges of uh, uh, what kind of things are happening that are successful and what kind of challenges and limitations are there that can be covered up. So this is one of the basic approach and we were really happy to see that uh, Maharashtra Forest Department is actually implementing this approach and uh, is actually getting benefit of implementing post-restoration monitoring to ensure successful restoration efforts. And so if I come to some important keywords of how we can accelerate the momentum for carbon sequestration, by involving people-centric approaches and community participation to meet the transformative change agenda, and that is to recognize and localize sustainable development goals and other promises of climate disaster and biodiversity. It has to be people-centric approaches, understanding and taking lessons from the past, co-learning approaches, what is happening in developing countries, underdeveloped and uh, developed countries, and how we can share this knowledge from each other, promoting incentives, because incentive is something that can promote community to develop these kind of promises and develop these kind of approaches and models. And of course, private sector financing uh, 
because that is very much required if you want to scale up the carbon sequestration potential of forest areas or non -for or outside the forest areas convergence of government different government line department because that's very necessary government and public fund goes in different departments with similar kind of aims and agenda so there needs to be convergence so that cost can be reduced and output can be maximized and of course mrv is monitoring reporting and verification to very much understand what kind of plantation is happening to meet carbon sequestration and ndc goals so if i want to summarize uh, what i have discussed in last few minutes enforcement of policies will be very much required we have some good policies but enforcement is necessary moving beyond uh, moving beyond protected areas and moving beyond um, revenue forest and seeing how these community conserved forest areas can be good model for everyone in terms of uh, creating these rich and protected forest and then of course discour discouraging greenwashing and promoting incentives we know that behind this carbon credit uh, there is a lot of greenwashing happening so ensuring what kind of species is being planted during carbon sequestration that needs to be well understood promoting incentives i talked about it india is still uh, and many countries in uh, in asia are still to understand more on red plus and how to have efficient models of payment of ecosystem services that is very much required developing compliance and voluntary markets there are a few like in china and uh, japan if i'm correct but there should be few more markets to meet these need requirement to fulfill the community needs and raise these uh, carbon markets and carbon plantation people centric approaches promoting ecological succession patterns and not just planting anything anywhere so right species at the right place following right based approaches and right cost multi stakeholder involvement citizen scientist and excess and benefit sharing once these models are there so with this i come to the last slide and i thank you once again for this opportunity to share my experiences with this entire interesting group thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Shalini. That was quite of a talk. Thank you so much. I'm sure the, the Q&A session that we will have in some minutes will be very interesting. So thank you. Um, and now uh, I will ask Professor Dida, are you there, to take the floor, share your screen, please. We'll be thrilled to hear you. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. So I'll share my slide now. Yep, so my talk tonight is, or well, today in your area, um, is about the overview of GIS-based carbon assessment. So I consider myself as a, a junior researcher, having been um, um, involved in some of the projects, and they, they usually ask me to map things, and that would include carbon. So I would like to start my talk with a trip of mine uh, a week ago. So for those who don't know, Philippines is a, a tropical country and we have a tropical forest here. And this place that you're seeing now is the Kaseknan protected water, um, protected landscape. So it is somewhere north in the Philippines. And um, we are conducting a focus group discussion here uh, for the feasibility of establishing payment for ecosystem services. So these people here are indigenous peoples. They are part of the Bugalot tribe. And we are actually asking them if they are somehow willing to sell, in a way, to sell the ecosystem services to people downstream. So we ask them to identify what services um, they're ecosystem their protected landscape provide and one of the uh, services that they mentioned is the carbon sequestration but not directly carbon sequestration but we, we processed that what they meant is carbon sequestration so um, carbon sequestration is one of the ecosystem services and uh, with the definition of ecosystem services these are the beneficial outcomes that um, we derive from the ecosystem um, carbon is actually an important element in our environment because it somehow helps regulate um, climate change. Um, the, the trees 
store carbon in the form of um, elemental carbon, as we call it, through photosynthesis. So the more trees we plant, the more carbon dioxide is actually stored as elemental carbon. And that is done through the process of the carbon cycle. So um, carbon is found everywhere in different forms. In the terrestrial ecosystem, we have carbon there. Okay? And in the forest, uh, IPCC uh, compartmentalized the types of carbon pools that we call. We have the above ground, we have the below ground, we have the litter, and we have the soil. And um, in the litter, there is actually dead matter there, but that was uh, lumped together here. So this was uh, mentioned a while ago by, by uh, Dr. Shalini. And we as foresters, as researchers, um, the first step towards carbon assessment is the measurement of these carbon pools. So we follow certain methods. We use certain tools to measure each carbon pool. Um, this is not only true for the forest ecosystem, but also for, for other ecosystems that we, that we have. So you can find the techniques and the recommended uh, tools to be used in the IPCC guidelines. Um, in forest carbon stock assessment, um, we follow this um, standard method. Um, in my research in the Philippines, when we conduct field or primary data collection, we follow this particular process. So we start with defining the boundary. So we start with a, um, an extent, could be an ecosystem or just a particular subset of that ecosystem. Then we try to stratify the study area. We try to define the sub-ecosystems or the um, land cover classes that are found there. So if you have agriculture area, we disaggregate the agriculture into crops and trees or agroforestry. For the forest, we try to disaggregate um, natural and plantation and for urban areas. Then we consider the carbon pools to be measured. So this dep um, it depends on the budget. So if you have a large amount of money, if you have the budget, then you can um, measure all the carbon pools. But sometimes we just limit our uh, measurement with uh, the above ground biomass. Um, and to some extent, the, to some extent the, the soil or the litter. Then uh, we establish the sampling plots because it is expensive and it is too costly to measure the entire landscape or the entire study area. So you establish sampling plots. Um, you use a certain formula such as a Slovin's formula or um, sampling techniques to identify the number of plots, the kind of plot, if you're using uh, individual plots or nested plots, uh, it depends on uh, your budget as well and your, your purpose. And then after that, you prepare the instrument, and then you go to the field and do the measurements. Um, for above ground biomass, uh, we usually measure the diameter of the trees. The actual measurement would involve cutting down the tree <laughs> and then putting it on a weighing scale, but we do not use that because that is destructive. So we use non-destructive methods such as the use of allometric biomass regression equation. So a lot of scientists did measure many trees, uh, the diameter, and then develop a formula so that when you put the diameter value, then it will yield a volume for you or um, a weight for that matter. Uh, the most popular, I believe, is... Uh, Brown's uh, equation, if you've encountered the, the Brown's um, formula for trees. And uh, you have to get a measurement of all the trees in that particular sampling plot. And then you have to blow up that to a per hectare value because um, biomass is usually in terms of um, per hectare or kilograms or tons per hectare. So you have to blow up your value. 
to that uh, scale. And uh, if you have um, non-woody plants such as your um, herbs or grasses, then you follow um, the sampling frame method. Uh, what we do here is that we um, cut, we cut the grasses, we cut the herbs, and then we get the weight, and then we dry that using an oven, and then we get the the difference, and that is your um, fresh, uh, your oven dried weight, and that would be your your biomass for that particular vegetation, and. These are usually found at the corners of your main inventory plot and at the center. But uh, it really depends. So some, some countries have their own um, standards in, in doing inventory and calculation of carbon. Um, in the Philippines, we have a standard as well. Um, we follow the, our department's uh, guidelines for establishing plots and for measuring and getting samples from here, from those plots. Uh, for the below ground biomass, uh, this is quite tricky and difficult because the roots are usually intact and then it's, it's quite hard to you know, pull them off or to get them. So uh, what we do, um, and this is supported by literature, is that we use the root to shoot ratio. Um, IPCC guidelines uh, also um, laid out the percentage um, de depending on the kind of ecosystem. Uh, for tropical forests, you have a certain value of percentage or root to, uh, root to shoot ratio. For temperate, you also have a different kind of value. So it's usually 20 to 40% of the above ground biomass. So if you have a value for a specific tree, you just get the 20 to 40 percent of that, and that would be your um, below ground biomass value. And then for the, the litter and the dead matter, um, we use the same nested or the subplots inside the bigger plot. Uh, we collect all the litter, the dead leaves, and then we drew, we do the oven dry method again. We weigh the fresh weight and then we put it in the oven and then get the the difference, and that would be the the um, the biomass for um, dead or litter. And there are also different methods for um, dead logs or um, standing logs, also. So we there are they are actually um, detailed in the guidelines of the IPCC. And for soil carbon, uh, we use the soil ogre. Um, to get a sample of the soil uh, between 10 centimeters to 30 centimeters. And then, yeah, we, we use the um, soil chemical analysis or the soil bulk density analysis. And uh, I think in other countries, there are also other means to do that. So in order to assess your carbon, you have to get measurements of from all of these carbon pool types. And then you blow up that to a per hectare and get a total, and then you, you'll get an estimate of that. There are also other tools that can be used in the estimation of uh, storage and sequestration. Um, I haven't used these uh, tools actually, but I just saw them in the literature. What I have used as a, a mapping practitioner is the invest carbon storage and sequestration model. And that is where the GIS-based carbon assessment comes into uh, play. Now, what is the invest carbon storage and sequestration model? So this model uses land use or land cover maps to estimate the total carbon for you. So the main input here is the land use or the land cover map that you have. So for storage, this is um, the mass of the carbon at any given time or period, while the sequestration is the change. And both um, concepts can be applied or can be derived through the model of INVEST. Okay, So INVEST is Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. So we use this model to get a landscape level 
or a watershed level uh, value of carbon. And then this model can be also used to derive the total value based on social cost of carbon. And if you have the social cost of carbon, you'll be able to get the value. And that would be the basis for you know, payment for ecosystem services or other analysis that you would like. Uh, for the land use land cover, it is important for uh, the study area to be dis disaggregated as much as possible. But if uh, not, then you can just use the standard land use or land cover types like your annual crop or perennial crop. Uh, you have the brush, the, the open forest, the closed forest. Yeah. But some studies actually disaggregate their landscape or their study area. They classify the plantations, they classify the crops, they classify the buildings. And for each class or type, you designate a particular carbon pool value. Okay, So you need to assign above ground, <clears throat> below ground, dead matter, and soil carbon for each land use or land cover type that you identified and made into a map. So you can actually use values from literature. Uh, we have country estimates. We have, um, uh, we have uh, studies that have conducted these kinds of carbon pool value estimation. So what you need to do is compile them in a, in a spreadsheet and then put them in the, in the system or in the software. And then what you will generate is basically a map showing the tons of carbon for that particular year. Okay, and if this is in terms of tons or megagrams per pixel, um, you will be able to generate the future. If you have a future land use scenario or a red scenario, uh, you'll be able to generate a, a carbon storage for the future year. Then if you have a present year and then a future year or a red scenario year, you'll be able to get the sequestration or the change in carbon. And finally, if you have the social cost of carbon, um, you'll be able to get the total value in dollars or in whatever currency that you want to have for the sequestered carbon. Now, what, is, what are the strengths and limitations of that model? Um, the strength of that model is it's simple. Um, it requires uh, little data. You just need the four carbon pool values. Um, it works for a large area, um, a good estimate or a good um, scenario for that. And economic valuation is possible because you, you can incorporate the social cost of carbon for each um, land use or landscape that you have. But uh, the model does not consider changes in the area. Like It's for one particular period only. So if you want to have um, dynamics, you have to generate many scenarios, uh, scenarios for that or different years, different future years for that. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we also have developing fields in remote sensing. For remote sensing, uh, we use satellite data to establish um, connections or relationships in terms of regression equations. So you can link the biomass value with a particular satellite image value, and that will give you a good uh, way to estimate for the entire area. So we use um, NDVI or the Normalized Div Difference Vegetation Index. Uh, for my thesis, I used um, a radar image. So I correlated the radar backscatter based on the height of trees with a plot level carbon uh, above ground biomass value. And I was able to estimate for an entire forest given a few samples of uh, a plot level above ground biomass. And uh, you can also use um, image classification method to develop your own land use or land cover maps. So if you don't have a detailed land use land cover map, you can use a remote sensing to make one. But we have 
uh, national level land cover maps available over the internet. We, we can also use the S3 land cover. We can use the um, the USGS uh, land cover maps for that purpose. Uh, for the ways moving forward, um, I believe that with the development of many technologies, there will be more alumetric equations for above ground biomass. Um, we, we already have a few of those in Indonesia um, and in some areas, and I think there will be more in the future. Then there will be the use of unmanned aerial systems or the high resolution imagery to disaggregate your land cover land use and to get a good estimate of the carbon. Um, big data and machine learning, we have already did that using Google Earth Engine. We have processed carbon maps and other carbon assessment through that platform. And for the field level collection, um, there will be um, advanced field instruments or sophisticated instruments, uh, like the use of range finders and uh, similar instrument that would be easier for us to get distance and diameter and as such. So that's my talk for, uh, for tonight. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, even though we have GIS remote sensing, it is still important to get field level measurements or actual measurements on the ground. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. It was a great talk. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I learned a lot. <laughs> so um, thank you once again, Professor Jan Joseph and Dr. Shalini. We would like to um, say thank you on behalf of ISA for being here and for all of the assistants that were enlightened with your presentation. Uh, so now we will be having a short 10 minutes session of Q&As. So I encourage you to share your questions in the chat or to raise your hand. You can also use the same code of Slido to share some questions um, and we can talk about them together. So yeah, don't be shy and share your questions. Okay, Boba, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dida and Shalini, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, I have a question. Maybe I missed something, but maybe you can clarify this. As I understand, uh, the uh, the biggest uh, carbon sequestration pool in forest is the soil. But uh, in your presentation, Professor Ditti, you mentioned that uh, when you have the opportunity to measure uh, the carbon pools, you give the uh, preference to the above ground biomass. Uh, so why, uh, why is it happening? Why you are not uh, going for the uh, biggest carbon pool and why you are deciding to go for the above ground biomass? Thank you. Um, actually, for this uh, context, um, as foresters, we usually do measurements um, with trees. But yeah, we, we can also give importance actually to those that uh, are not on the above ground or like below ground and the soil matter. Um, for this example, I, I just focus on the, uh, the above ground um, through the trees that we usually measure as foresters. So I would like, just like to add to what Professor Rida mentioned, because in our studies, what we have done, uh, we were previously definitely using uh, above ground and below ground biomass to project uh, the carbon sequestration or carbon stocks of a forest. But we got to know if we actually want to project uh, the entire the potential of this forest. We also need to include uh, not only uh, soil organic carbon, but also bulk density of the soil, because that determines the total carbon stock or carbon sink that is existing in these forest areas. So for the, the younger participants, I'm sure this will be relevant when you are using these studies from, and this was very interesting what uh, Professor Dida also mentioned about using infest for using this and, and this is indeed helpful when you talk about projecting how your forests are, what kind of carbon stocks in, they will have in future. 
uh, what what we tried to use in terms of the same uh, invest model uh, for one of the mangrove forest areas, the blue carbon stock, we tried to understand what kind of drivers are there that are affecting these mangrove forest areas because that define how the future land uses will look like. So there are something as scientists that we know about forest areas, but there is much more that the local participants and stakeholders know about. So that gives us a little more clear projections. Uh, and we did one this study. So I am really thankful that Professor Dida brought in the context of invest to this platform and webinar. So shall I go or you would like to read these questions because I think I'm reading these questions. Yeah, um, there's one for you. So if you like to take over that, it would be nice. Oh. Thank you. So I think there is a question on future of carbon markets. Uh, so the way we had a discussion this morning itself, that even if you talk about uh, these carbon markets are coming somewhere, uh, uh, this is is basically how the emissions happening in the West and then trying to sequester in different parts, especially global South. So there is definitely a lot of requirement of these carbon markets. And if you have seen some of the recent publication of NASA, how using their uh, satellites and uh, GIS based approaches, they're actually monitoring these forest areas across the world and seeing what kind of carbon stocks are available. But at the same time, it's very important to understand that this carbon market will be very crucial and there has to be a proper regulation and verification in place. Because if they're promoted uh, with, a, with in a manner that there is a no monitoring or a proper regulation in place, there are chances like how it is happening that most of the forests that are being restored back for carbon stocks are, and that are requirement of carbon markets. You need fast growing forest areas that can be sold in these carbon markets. So there is a huge scope, but at the same time, there is a requirement of regulation on how these carbon markets are selling and uh, doing this entire credit system. What kind of carbon credits are coming in these markets? Are they the market that are created only based on some of the monocultures or plantations that are fast growing high biomass yielding species? They try to be very disruptive for the known natural forest areas. So I think uh, this concern has to be there because we have very, very small time. Uh, these carbon markets are going to be the most effective by 20, I mean, the time period is about 2030, where you are restoring fast and selling these carbon credits so that communities can be involved. But there has to be a proper verification at every level. So that will really help how, how, how we can use the better or best of these carbon markets. Markets. Yes, Professor John, do you have anything to add to that statement? Uh, I think I'd like to actually answer the next uh, the question uh, uh, about the GIS, but it's down there already. <laughs> Don't worry, I can read it for you. Um, the question was related with is yeah, well, I'll I'll read it. Is GIS based assessment the most effective for carbon assessment? Um, I'd like to say that it is an effective, but again, GIS is just a model. So, um, whatever your input is, uh, would I mean affect your output most probably. So, if your carbon pool values, for example, are erroneous, your field collection is erroneous, then you will get an erroneous landscape level carbon estimation. So um, this is true if your ground level or field level collection is accurate and is done um, religiously or in terms of uh, due diligence, you've done the right way. And I also like to, yeah, to second what Dr. Chaturvedi in the chat said that you still need to conduct um, ground validation when you use um, satellite images to develop regressions or to model for entire landscape because um, your regression might not be correct if you don't have the, the correct um, accuracy level for your image. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question directed for Dr. Cellini and the question is, what's the main challenge related with carbon and involving communities in the assessment? And there is another one talking about what's the potential of mangroves forests for carbon sequestration 
and maybe that's uh, related with your talk too. So in case you want to aim those both questions, it would be great. I'll go with the last question first. So uh, we all know that you all coming from the background of forestry, you know that uh, blue carbon has a huge potential, even more than what tropical and these other forest types are providing, especially because of their deeper, uh, uh, these uh, soil carbon that is deeper in uh, greater depths. So that makes these uh, blue carbon very valuable and also makes mangrove forest highly uh, demanded in these forest and carbon markets. So there is a huge potential and there is no doubt for that. And now coming to the second question, what is the main challenge with carbon and involved communities? See, what we see as a major challenge in all, all these uh, years working with people is, uh, one thing is you can definitely make these communities learn and develop capacity for how to take uh, ground truthing information. For example, taking the DBH, using the quadrate based sampling, analyzing the uh, tree height and all these raw data. So they are very good with that and they can be definitely involved. But uh, you will definitely need more engagement on uh, how and what is the precision of this data that is taken up. And the second thing is, uh, there will be definitely, they can be only a kind of semi-skilled and unskilled workers who take this information on ground and then you further take this computer-based work and analysis of this data to further use up. And the second important challenge is uh, involving community itself, trust building and involving in these uh, assessments, unless and until they, they, that brings back some kind of incentives to them or generates a kind of alternative or direct livelihood options. It's, it's tough to convince community to join these, these models. There are a lot of community models that are being developed, but uh, the reason why these models are very scattered and we don't see a lot of upscaling happening, I think that's because of the kind of livelihood opportunities that are linked in the very initial stage right now. It definitely needs a little more capacity building awareness among communities. And the second more thing, second thing is uh, also that we discussed recently was there's a common perception with even Red Plus that uh, the money and the dollars are directly going to the communities in their pockets. While they, that's not the case in very much reality, where the larger portion of this money actually goes for the entire community, entire village to improve their living conditions, improve their sanitation, water requirements, so on and so forth. So that kind of clarity also needs to be shared and discussed with the communities when we are involving them in carbon related, carbon market related jobs and opportunities. Thank you very much. Well, um, we have a few more questions, but our time is kind of um, reaching to the end. So um, I would like to ask you if it's possible for you to share your emails so people can ask the question direct, directly to you in case they are having like more um, questions. And to ask you also if you want to share one final thought or um, something you would like to share with the audience. So uh, I have typed my uh, email ID in the chat box. So those who would like to learn more or have queries that couldn't be answered because of the time schedule we had, they can contact me. And I'm, I'm really happy that this kind of discussion was uh, arranged because I think Professor Dira brought in all these uh, the methodological aspects of how these things should be done. And that's very relevant for PhDs, masters, and postdoc candidates, where I bring this perspective of how this real-time carbon sequestration thing is actually required and how this global politics is actually booming and revolving around carbon sequestration. So I hope that really helps these participants, and I'm really pleased to see them coming from different parts of the world. So that's a really great opportunity to share and express myself. Yeah, okay, that's sorry. the magic of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go on, Professor. Yeah. So uh, as a young researcher, I encourage everyone to continue learning, to continue looking for innovative ways to um, calculate, to estimate the carbon stock and sequestration. 
And then we do not stop at quantif quantification. We need to relate this to the people, translate this into a value so that it would be become more meaningful at the landscape level. So yeah, I feel home now because as an, a former IFSA member, I share the same drive, the same energy with the students. And yeah, I'm also very interested and um, um, lucky to have heard the lecture of Dr. Shalini. I learned a lot as well. So thank you very much. So once again, thank you for taking the time to be here, for sharing your knowledge with us, uh, and to believe that IFSA is a good platform uh, to ex ex express, sorry, the the knowledge and the forest love too. <laughs> so thank you and a virtual applause and hug for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. We got a lot of questions, so we are also collecting these. And once we send the certificates for participation, we are also trying to send the answers for these because we are short on time right now, so we can uh, read all the questions. So now before we give our uh, closing remarks, we want to ask you to open your cameras so we can take a nice picture of the event. Yes, <laughs> lovely faces. Okay, so we're waiting for other participants to open their cameras. Okay, so Belle, are you ready? <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay, so open your cameras, guys, and smile. One, two, three. Okay, another one for the second um, slide, the second page. <clears throat> okay, so smile. One, two, three. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. And before you leave this session, uh, first, we want to share our closing remarks with you. So, um, are you are able to see my screen? Yes, okay. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us for our first episode. So, the role of forest in carbon sequestration, it was amazing to hear from our amazing speakers. So, but we also want to invite you for our next episode. The second one is going to be next Saturday at 3 p.m. UTC zero. It's about local carbon policies as pillars for global implementation. So here is also the link of registration. And next is the episode three, uh, Healthy Forest for Healthy Humans. Uh, it's going to be on April 1st at 2 p.m. UTC zero. And also we're having a special quiz about our session. So you have to join everything. <laughs> it's going to be on the 25th uh, of March. So make sure to follow IFSA on social media so you can know more about this. And of course, we want to know uh, what was your, uh, if your expectations were met during this first episode, we want to hear your feedback. So please um, fill out this form. And also uh, here you can get um, your certificate. It's going to be sent to your emails and also the answers to the questions uh, we have left today. So also in the chat, I sent the links and please, uh, we want to hear from you and I, we hope to see you in our next episode. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs> See you next Friday. Thank you, Dr. Shelley and Professor Dida. Thank you. I have a message for you, Belle. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.